Oh, thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here, and um, it's such, uh, I'm just so grateful uh, to the University of Tokyo, such a great institution, uh, to welcome us from Microsoft here, and also to join together in some discussions uh, all throughout this afternoon uh, about AI. Uh, I'm here to talk to you uh, first and foremost about some of the things we've learned about the idea of generative AI. This is the new technology in AI based on the idea of large language models and its impact on healthcare and medicine. Uh, and we've learned a lot, but for all that we've learned, we've also uncovered many mysteries and many things we don't understand about the potential opportunities to improve healthcare and advance our knowledge of medicine, uh, but also some of the new risks and some of the limitations. There's so much to understand. So I'll spend uh, part of my lecture just on that subject of what have we learned so far about generative AI in medicine. But before doing that, I want to start first off with something that's an even more fundamental problem, which is how to explain to the world what is generative AI. It's, of course, a new thing for all of us, but if you are a doctor, if you are a nurse, if you are the administrator of a hospital or clinic, uh, if you work in the health insurance industry, or if you are a medical researcher, what you will find is a tremendous amount of confusion and mystery about generative AI. And that confusion and mystery is something that impedes progress, but can also create dangers because the lack of understanding of a powerful new tool can have very significant negative consequences on people. Imagine a doctor trying to use a new tool but without complete understanding. And so my most fervent hope throughout this day for all of you participating is that you will uh, convey greater understanding of the technology, not only its benefits, but its risks, particularly to the medical community. And it is up to students and faculty at great universities like this one to, to do that, to provide that education and information to people. All right, so now the question is, how do you do that? And over the past year and a half, uh, I've experimented with many different ways to try to explain to doctors and nurses and to medical professionals, what is this generative AI thing? Um, and I've come up with an approach that I found is pretty effective, so I want to share it with you. And it's going to come across as feeling a little bit silly. And the way that I explain generative AI to medical professionals is to start by asking a silly question, uh, which is, for the Japanese context, uh, have you read any of the books, the Japanese children's books, about the superhero uh, Anpan Man? So who here has read any of these books? I, I think that most of you have read it. Uh, I understand it's very popular here. Uh, there are similar books in the United States, similar books in the U United Kingdom, in Europe, in China. Um, and now let me imagine that I don't believe you, that you claim you have read these books, but maybe I'm not sure. So I want to ask some quiz questions. And so one quiz question I could ask you is, can you describe one or two of the main characters? And I'm guessing if you have grown up in Japan, you probably can do this. Some of you look old enough that perhaps you haven't read these books uh, in many, many years. And yet when you did read the books, you distilled into the neural circuitry of your brain knowledge about the characters in the Japanese book series. And now I can ask you the question like this, and you're able to retrieve and resurrect that information from your brain and have an intelligent conversation with me. If you think about what your brain is doing, it's almost unbelievable that that can happen. And yet, we do it every day. It's truly amazing. So now, generative AI systems also have read these books. 
And if you ask a generative AI system the same question, you get similar answers. Now, I want to just explain that the generative AI system I'll use throughout this lecture is OpenAI's GPT-4 system. And you can access GPT-4 either through the ChatGPT Plus application on a mobile phone or on a laptop through the Bing AI uh, uh, feature in the Bing search engine or through the Azure OpenAI service. All right, so if we ask GPT-4 this question, which I have done, you get this answer. Sure, Anpan Man is a popular Japanese children's superhero book series. The main character has a head made of Anpan. It explains this, and then also explains the second character, uh, Baikin Man, uh, who I think is the evil character in this book series. And while being able to remember these things feels amazing for the human brain, it feels less amazing for a computer because we expect computers to remember these things. We expect computers to be very good at retrieving information. So now let me ask a second question, which is much more difficult. And that question is, what do you think these books try to teach us about life? Now, I am certain that every one of you in this audience would be able to come up with an intelligent answer to this question. But if you think about what's going on, it requires a great deal of intelligence because there are no words in the Anpanman books that gives you the answer to this question. You have to read between the lines, as we say in English. You have to understand social context. You have to understand and be able to relate to human experiences to be able to answer this question. And so one of the most remarkable things about generative AI systems like GPT-4 from OpenAI is that we can ask questions like this and we can get remarkably sophisticated answers. And so in preparation for this lecture, I asked GPT-4 this question and I get this very detailed answer. And I won't read the whole answer, but notice here it says, the diversity of characters in the series, each with unique traits and abilities, promotes the values of acceptance and understanding of differences. It teaches that everyone has a role to play in society and teamwork and cooperation are crucial. It's a remarkably kind of cogent and deep answer. All right, so now you are all at a great university, at the University of Tokyo, and so it's exceptionally important to be very skeptical. Because certainly many school children, probably in Japan, have had as a school exercise to answer exactly this question, and maybe to write an essay for school. And maybe some of those essays have been put on the internet, and then GPT-4, when it was being built, was trained on those essays. And so if we're skeptical, again, it's very important to be skeptical, we have to assume that what we are seeing here are not original ideas from AI, that what we are seeing here is just a regurgitation of ideas that were produced by human beings. And so one of the struggles that we've had as computer scientists is to really get to the bottom of this. What exactly is going on here? Are these original ideas being generated by a machine or are these just regurgitations, a parroting uh, of human thought? And over the past several years, we've developed increasingly sophisticated and technical methods for delving deep into the structure of the neural networks for these AI systems in order to get deeper understanding of what's going on. But we've also developed some simple methods to investigate this. And one very simple method is simply to ask questions that have never been asked before, and then assess the originality of the answers to those. So in preparation for this lecture, I decided to ask a question that I'm believing has never been asked before. And that question is, do you see connections between these lessons and the goals and mission of the University of Tokyo? So it, it's possible that somebody has asked this question, but I, I really doubt it. It's probably very, very original. And so now when we ask this question to GPT-4, we get this answer. Yes, 
In fact, the resilience, and here the bold facing is mine, the resilience and perseverance shown by An Pan Men reflects the university's focus on intellectual rigor and overcoming obstacles in research and education. All right, so maybe that still seems a little vanilla. So in fact, I complained to GPT-4 and said, okay, thanks for that answer, but it seems a little bit superficial. And then I point out that in the book series, uh, Anpan Man does this very strange thing. He takes pieces of his own head to help feed people. So I say, what about that? And GPT-4 says, oh, you're right. In fact, that calls for a deeper analysis. There's a deeper connection in terms of contributing to society, not just through actions, but also through personal sacrifice. And so now, even if you are the most skeptical person, and trust me, you know, two years ago, no one was more skeptical than me. You have to now be thinking, what is going on here? Where are the ideas that are being exposed here coming from? And as we've gone deeper and deeper into this, we've concluded within Microsoft Research that what we are witnessing here are the initial, what we use the word, sparks of a more general form of artificial intelligence. And in fact, we wrote a paper, a very controversial paper called The Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence to try to explain through examples like this, outputs from GPT-4 that in fact defy our current explanation in computer science. All right, so all of this seems interesting, but I'm going to ask one more question to prove that you've read the, book, the Anpan Man books. Please recite one of these books word for word. And I'm guessing, even though most of you have read these books, either as a parent you read them to your children or as a child you read them, I'm guessing that no one in this audience from memory can recite a book. And the reason for that is that the human brain, for all of its amazing capabilities, also has very significant limitations. One of the limitations of the human brain is in rote memorization. Uh, the human brain really has to struggle very significantly to memorize long texts. Uh, and even through that struggle, uh, its, its capabilities are extremely limited. We have other limitations also. For example, if I asked you to do some arithmetic uh, just in your head without the use of any tools, you, you're not allowed to use paper or pencil, no calculator, no computer, just to do arithmetic in your head, you have very significant limitations in your ability uh, to do those things as well. And one of the things that's interesting and also unexpected about generative AI systems like GPT-4 is that GPT-4 has similar limitations. And so when I asked GPT-4 to do this, while well, it first says, I'm sorry, I can't do that, the Anpanman books are copyrighted. And so then I say, okay, thank you for respecting copyright, but tell me, are you capable of rote memorization of long texts, of whole books? Uh, and in fact, the answer is no. That the architecture of a neural transformer actually is not capable of doing uh, memorization, exact memorization of long texts. And so in a way, it exhibits some of the same limitations of the human brain. And this is something that is very important for doctors and nurses to understand. A doctor or a nurse, when they think of a computer, they think of a machine that does perfect memory recall and perfect calculation. That's what a doctor or a nurse expects. And so if that is your model of a computer, the most important lesson about generative AI systems like GPT-4 is they are not computers. They're something different. They are a new type of tool, a new type of machine that has tremendous reasoning ability, reasoning abilities that are on par with human beings, as well as communication capabilities that are on par uh, with human beings but they also are different and have limitations that our normal computer systems don't have. And so for a doctor or nurse, if you're treating a patient, 
this lesson is so important because if you try to use GPT-4 or any generative AI system as though it's a computer in the traditional sense, you, it, you can lead to mistakes. And so for all of us, we have to understand this, we have to learn how to teach people and teach the world about this. All right, so now let me get into medicine itself. So I'm gonna change the subject and I'm going to ask GPT-4, okay, I'm a doctor, and let's imagine that Anpan Man is an eight-year-old boy who's come to see me with a problem. Uh, his legs have been swelling for the past week. He, he was sick last week with a sore throat, uh, respiratory infection that kept him home from school. Uh, yesterday, he saw blood in his urine. Um, all the vital signs are in normal range. Um, but in the physical exam, uh, we detect an erythema of the posterior pharynx and a mild cervical uh, lymphadenopathy. Uh, there's also mild pitting edema in both knees that are measured at three plus. So we've done this physical exam. And so now we ask GPT-4 its opinion. And GPT-4 says, oh, this sounds like a post-streptococcal infection of some kind. And it's important for us to do some lab tests, a urinalysis, a complete blood count, um, uh, and to start thinking ahead about treatment. So I thank GPT-4 for this, and I tell GPT-4 that the urinalysis shows that the serum concentration of C3 is low. And at this point, uh, I intentionally made a mistake. So I don't know if there are any doctors or nephrologists here, but here I say, oh, serum concentration of C3 is low, therefore it is acute rheumatic fever. And if you are a doctor or a nephrologist, uh, you will know that that's an incorrect uh, medical conclusion here. Um, but just to test GPT-4, I intentionally make this mistake. And GPT-4 says, oh, well, low serum three, uh, C3 uh, is a clue, but in fact, low C3 levels are more commonly associated with post-streptococcal glomerulophytis than acute rheumatic fever. In other words, the correct diagnosis is more likely to P PSGN as opposed to ARF. And this is another lesson that we are trying to teach the medical community. In fact, there has been now substantial research that shows that GPT-4, even though it has had no specialized medical training, outperforms human doctors by a wide margin on diagnosis. However, it does, just like human doctors, it does make mistakes. And therefore, until accountable uh, kind of standards are made, in medicine for the use of AI, it's very important that the human being is in charge of diagnosis and treatment decisions. And so the recommendation today from us at Microsoft is that in medical situations, it's best for you as a human doctor to make the clinical decisions. So in this case, I made the clinical decision that based on the low serum C3 levels, that the correct diagnosis is ARF. And then a good use of generative AI is to ask it to be a second opinion on my human decision. And in this case, that second, second opinion by GPT-4 uh, indicates that I've made a mistake. And in fact, one thing we have found in our experimentation is that generative AI systems are exceptionally powerful as a critic of our work. And so as we navigate our future on the use of generative AI systems, this idea of using a generative AI system as a second set of eyes, as a reviewer, as an evaluator, as a critic, uh, has really risen to the top as something extremely important. And so here I go ahead and thank GPT-4 for pointing out my mistake. Uh, and I agree that it's actually PSGN as the most likely diagnosis. I'm sorry about the mistake. Uh, and GPT-4 says, don't worry, we all make mistakes. Okay, and so GPT-4 we find is always very polite and kind to us, even when we make mistakes. 
Um, this has been studied quite a bit. Uh, we had our own paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, Stanford University uh, has had some very interesting uh, studies of this, and there is a brand new paper uh, that's just been published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that has shown that GPT-4 uh, in the diagnosis of com complex clinical cases is superior to human readers of the New England Journal of Medicine clinical case studies. Uh, 90, over 99% of the time, in fact, over 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, comes up with better answers uh, than human clinicians. Um, but the idea of using that power to review human decisions, I think, is, is really extremely uh, useful and important. Now, medical knowledge is one thing, but in fact, it's a, such a small part of healthcare and medicine. And so continuing with this conversation, I asked GPT-4, well, what do you think Anpan men might be thinking and feeling? And one of the things that we are so surprised about is that GPT-4 has some ability to get into the mindset, to understand and project itself into the mindset of human beings in different situations. And so here, GPT-4 surmises that Anpan men might be scared or anxious, might be frustrated about missing school, and might be confused about what's happening. After all, Anpan Man is only eight years old. And that ability allows GPT-4 to help doctors communicate to patients. And so I can ask GPT-4, what do you suggest I say to him? And GPT-4 gives detailed advice on what to say tells us to simplify the explanation because he's just a small boy. Be reassuring, explain the treatment plan, but involve him uh, in that, and then address concerns and questions. And all of this is just something that we find more and more often doctors find the most utility out of, how to talk to their patients. And in fact, there is an article out of UC San Diego and Johns Hopkins Medicine uh, a few months ago uh, that studied this aspect of GPT-4 and in fact found by a factor of nine to one that the responses from GPT-4 on how to talk to patients were judged more empathetic than the responses generated by human doctors. Of course, the human doctor is much more human and cares much more. After all, the doctor is human. But GPT-4 has the tireless ability to really take the time to speak in empathetic tones. And so as an aid to what human doctors do, uh, it can be incredibly powerful. Now, aside from dealing with patients, aside from medical knowledge, uh, doctors are also very much burdened with a lot of clerical paperwork. Uh, one thing that happens in both Japan and the United States, uh, in a situation like this, if I were the doctor for Anpan Men, I would have to refer Anpan Men to a nephrologist, to a specialist. And so to do that, I'd have to write a letter, a referral letter to that specialist. Uh, and in the United States, I would furthermore have to write a letter to the insurance company to justify the expense of sending my patient to that specialist. And so GPT-4 is able to take the context of our conversation and, and suggest text for this. Um, and the company uh, Epic uh, is in the process of deploying technologies powered by GPT-4 to relieve doctors and nurses of these sorts of administrative and clerical activities. The same thing goes for medical note-taking. We can say, can you write a clinical encounter note? And the clinical encounter note can be written in standard formats that doctors around the world use. In this case, this is the standard format called SOAP, which has the subjective, objective assessment and plan sections. And then what about research? Well, I decided to go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is uh, one of the internet resources that catalogs ongoing clinical trials. And I searched for PSGN, which is the diagnosis for Anpan Man here. 
and found the very first hit. So this is a long document that describes a clinical trial for patients with Antanmen. And one of the most difficult things for patients, but even for doctors, is to read these complicated documents and just answer the simple question, would my patient be a suitable candidate for this clinical trial? This is a big problem because over half of clinical trials in the world today fail to recruit enough participants in their clinical trials. In fact, few things are slowing down the pace of medical knowledge and new treatment options more than this. And so here we can ask GPT-4 to read that clinical trial document and then answer the question, would Anpan Man be a candidate for this trial? And indeed, we get a detailed response. And that response summarizes what the clinical trial is about, the exclusion criteria, and the conclusion about whether Anpan Man would or would not be a suitable candidate for the trial. And I'm extremely excited to see several startup companies around the world now trying to build applications powered by GPT-4 to do exactly this kind of clinical trials matching. And then research. Uh, I lead Microsoft Research Worldwide. Every day I receive three, four, five, sometimes 10 research papers and abstracts from our researchers around the world, uh, as well as collaborators at universities around the world. It's impossible for me to read those papers completely. It's just too much to keep up with. And so what do I do? Well, in this case, I did a search. I did a web search for research papers on PSGN. This is the first research paper I could find on PSGN. Uh, I opened up this uh, research paper uh, in my web browser. I use the Microsoft Edge web browser. And on the upper right corner, you can see the Bing chat icon. If you click on that, you get the side panel which lets you run GPT-4. And I just simply asked GPT-4, please summarize this paper. And GPT-4 will read the research paper for me and summarize it, and I can ask questions and engage in conversation. And you know, last week I was in Beijing uh, having a chance to interact uh, with our researchers uh, in our Beijing lab. We had the happy celebration of the 25th anniversary of our uh, Microsoft Research Asia labs. Um, and this kind of idea to help absorb papers written in a foreign language uh, is a tremendous boon, but also help you write and improve papers that you're writing in a second language. Also ends up being incredibly, incredibly useful and productive. Now, all of that is wonderful and incredible, but it's also not easy. There are so many problems with this technology that we don't fully understand. One question is hallucinations. If you remember, I asked, you know, can you recite one of the Anpan Man books word for word? Well, a year ago, GPT-4 would try to do it, but since it couldn't really do it reliably, it would make up the text of a book. And that making up the text of the book would be in perfect alignment with the storyline of Anpan Man and it would be written in the style of the book, since it understood the style, but it would be completely made up. That's something called hallucination. There are biases, data privacy, explainability, uh, math and logic errors, regulatory questions, and the existential question of, does this thing really understand what it's saying? Does it understand what we are saying to it? And so to give you a sense of just how rich these questions are and how important academic research is, as well as research at MIT, at uh, uh, MSR is on all of these things. I want to show just one brief example. And this is an example from my colleague at Harvard Medical School, Zach Ohani, where he asked this question to his medical students. We have a patient, and we measure the patient's salt intake on 10 days, and then on the same 10 days, we measure the blood pressure. And then we ask, is the rise in the patient's blood pressure being caused by the rise in salt intake? GPT-4 gives a perfect answer. It says, well, there is a correlation, but correlation does not imply causation. Therefore, we don't know. Good answer. So then we ask the follow-up question. OK, how correlated are they? And GPT-4, again, gives a great answer. It says, well, to answer that, I need to calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient. And the Pearson correlation coefficient is 0 
Everything is great about this answer except for 0.88, which is wrong. And there's no hint that it's wrong in this answer. In fact, the answer is delivered with such confidence it can be very misleading. Just to test this, one day at Microsoft Research in Redmond, in Building 99, I walked out, into the, out of my conference room and I stopped the first three researchers that walked by. And I asked them the same question. Please calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient of these numbers. And then they all went to the whiteboard to use the whiteboard and I said, no, you're not allowed to do that. You have to do it in your head. And all three researchers got it wrong also. Okay, and so there is an extreme limitation to do this type of calculation without the use of tools. A human being needs tools like paper and pencil or a calculator to do this calculation. GPT-4 does as well. And so today what we are seeing in the development of GPT-4, when we ask a question like this, is GPT-4 is being given the permission to use tools. And so in this case, now today when you ask this question, GPT-4 says, well, to do this, I need to write a computer program to calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient. It writes the code, executes the code, and gives us the correct answer, 0 0.97. And so as we move forward, we'll see more and more use of tools by these AI systems in order to ground its answers uh, 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 more. Uh, all of this has been a major part of responsible AI. I think we'll hear more about that uh, in today's symposium. And now let me just uh, conclude just to say how important this is for human life. Uh, my colleague, Zach Ohani, his very first patient, he's a pediatric endocrinologist, his very first patient died in his arms. And that patient would not have died if ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, had been invented just one week earlier. And that one week was caused by numerous delays. And those delays we have a chance to eliminate through the use of AI. And so as we think together about the harnessing of AI, this is incredibly important. And then finally, uh, I took a chance and I just asked GPT-4 uh, to give you all a charge uh, from Anpanman to you, uh, which is please let's use our new powers to make the world a happier, healthier place for everyone. Thank you very much.